Hello again. Please have your seats. And we are about to start the next session of our uh, workshop. This one will be dedicated to the origins of uh, gender differences. Origin with the NES, a plural, because of course we are not here probably to, to solve this issue which has been already uh, addressed a bit this morning. But we want to show through uh, our three panelists uh, various approaches to the question of where does these, do the these, uh, gender differences that we observe in the behavior, in the status, uh, uh, comes from or maybe uh, impacted from uh, various uh, differences in the brain. That will be a part of the issue which will be addressed uh, by uh, Gina Ripon here. Uh, then we will see how the differences that has been reported sometimes with some bias in the brain and in the behavior may still have some truth, uh, some grains of truth in uh, what is don't known from uh, experimental psychology. Uh, and I think it will be also in connection with which, as it, which has been uh, discussed this morning, the amplitude of those differences. And this will be uh, discussed by uh, Camille Williams. And then uh, Naomi Elmers will uh, introduce us on how those bias differences uh, might impact organization and vice versa. So just to uh, start with uh, one of the longest and most, uh, I would say, uh, energetic title of, the, of this uh, session today, uh, Stand Up to Stereotypes. I, I, I let uh, Professor Gina Rippons put the emphasis on uh, the exclamation point. How a gendered world can, can make a gendered brain and why this matters. So uh, I please uh, invite uh, Gina Rippon, who is Professor Emeritus in Cognitive Neuroimaging uh, at Ashton University in Birmingham, in, uh, uh, yeah. and, uh, in Birmingham and uh, also she's the author of uh, this uh, book which you may have already uh, seen uh, here and there on uh, the gendered brain. So you have the scene, please. Thank you. Apologies for the long title. It could probably take about 20 minutes on picking what that actually <laughs> is telling us. Um, why this matters is, is probably what the whole event is about. So I will get to that at the end, but also being aware of the time. I should move quickly to my presentation. Sorry, do you want me to? Okay, right. It's a disadvantage of being small. <laughs> oh, I can. All oh, right, brilliant. Oh, that's so much better. Thank you. Okay, so stand up to stereotypes. It's really having been asked to give you a 20-minute overview of why we think males and females are different and what these consequences are. I thought what I really need to do is try and con contract into a very short period of time. Um, very briefly, why we had ever thought that, for example, the brain would be involved in differences between men and women where we are in the 21st century with that particular argument and what 21st century neuroscience has got to bring to this argument. So I am assuming that that's why I have been invited. Um, and as Karim mentioned, I've written a book called The Gendered Brain. The thesis of that is basically that we need to pay a lot more attention in order to understand differences between males and females, because I'm not denying that there are any. Uh, we need to pay much more attention to what's going on in the outside world. Now, this is the original sort of chain of argument, what I call the inside-out model, the idea that there, was some, there is something intrinsic within our brain which uh, determines our particular portfolio of skills, and that particular portfolio of skills determines our place in society. So I've called it how sex gets to be gender, and again, that could be a 20, well, probably 20-year discussion on the difference between sex and gender, but we'll bring that up in the questions, I suspect. But the very early approach, end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, was that whatever it was that determined the differences between male and female anatomy, because they could see that, we didn't have any access direct access to the brain as we do now with brain imaging, whatever it was that determined that difference also determined the type of brain you had. So if you had a female anatomy, you had a lady brain, and if you had a, a male anatomy, you had a manly brain. And that was hardwired, fixed, predetermined, pre-programmed, however you like to think about it. And having that sort of brain then gave you a particular portfolio of skills, which, uh, with the help of experimental psychologists running all sorts of different experiments, um, 
came up with what I call the go-to list of differences between males and females. So we have the idea that um, if you have a lady brain, you're good at understanding emotions, you're very empathic, but rubbish at reading maps. And there is a whole list of, of categories which experimental psychologists and the outside world, which is important, believe is characteristic of females. And similarly, the manly brain gave you access to those really, really important skills of, for example, spatial cognition, which would make you a great scientist. Um, you weren't very good at understanding emotions or listening, but that didn't matter because you were going to be independent and, and a great leader. And that particular portfolio then gave you different places in society. So. Uh, if you're empathic, then of course you'll be very good at caring, uh, being a nurse, being a primary school teacher, being wife and mother, etc. Whereas if you're um, uh, independent, rational, logic, you'll be a great scientist or a great explorer, a, a leader. So this is where, if you like, the idea that the brain is somehow involved in gender gaps. And of course, because it's an essentialist argument and there's reference to terms like hardwired, instantly you get a kind of stereotype out there that this is what women are like and therefore if you want somebody empathic let's go and get a lady let's have a female leader and there is this inbuilt bias of itself which all women are empathic so if you want somebody empathic let's just go and get a woman and similarly with a man uh, you know if their defining characteristic is that they're taller and you want somebody to get luggage off the top shelf that may be your your um, recruiting characteristic so we then need to say, okay, so how has that argument gone? Once we did have access to the intact living human brain uh, in intact living humans, even if they were in scanners at the time, and we need to devise particular tasks, which I'll come back to later. So unfortunately, not to completely dis feel like I'm dismissing what's coming next, if you look at the current arguments or the current data about differences between males and female brains, we look at brain imaging data and say, is there any evidence that there is a difference between male and female brains? Let's have a look at 30 years of brain imaging data, which we've now got, and see if there are any consistent differences. My answer to that is a broad no, but it is a, a cautious no, because I think, and we may, Camille may come on to this in the next talk, it depends why you're asking the question. Are you asking about differences between Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, for example, or are you asking why there are so few women do physics and robotics? Different kind of questions, different kind of context. Similarly, if you look at this nice, clear distinction between male and female categories, none of that stands up to clear scrutiny when you look at um, meta-analyses or metasyntheses, etc. So you cannot guarantee that you will know what somebody is like if they're male and female. You will say, well, this is a female, so she'll be empathic. This is a male, so he'll be good at maths and science, etc. But that's because we need to bear in mind we're talking about average differences here. We're not talking about individual differences. And if you look at the, um, how the data overlap, if you get average data from males and another lot from females, huge amount of overlap, tiny little effect size. But that gets forgotten. But we're still presented with the problem of gender gaps. And there's, again, another whole talk one could give about the measures of gender gaps and how they still persist and how you know, the World Economic Forum this year, last year now, published a finding that in the one year that the pandemic took place, looking at the rate of change in gender gaps in the 150, 60 world, uh, countries they're looking at in the world, they've tracked the rate at which the world is heading towards true gender equality. It was 99.5 years in 2020. In 2021, we're looking at 132.5 years, so a whole generation difference. So this is partly the answer to why this matters. What can 21st century neuroscience bring to this argument? And actually, it's been fantastic. I've been sitting here scribbling over my script because the preceding speakers have almost all um, come up with the explanations that I keep thinking, I'm never going to be able to get this into 20 minutes if I've got to go through this. So thank you very much to all of you for actually already um, producing the kind of information that we need to understand if neuroscience is going to contribute to this argument. The three, what I call the three Ps, your brains are like predictive textures. We've already come up with the idea that our brains are, are, are kind of driving us rather like a sort of high-end uh, sat-nav, high-end guessing, uh, guessing machine through the world. 
The brain is not just a passive recipient of information. The brain is looking into the outside world, monitoring the consequences of actions that their owners have taken, um, uh, situations that their owners have encountered, etc., and generating rules. And those rules are really important because they give us a clear idea of what's going to happen next, or a clear prediction, if you like. And we are driven by those predictions. If it turns out those predictions are wrong, then they can be corrected. But as we've already heard, sometimes it's quite difficult. But we need to realize that that's what the brain is doing. It is generating rules by looking in the outside world. Similarly, we know that our brains are plastic or flexible and moldable throughout our lifetimes and that the experiences we have will change the brain. So the brain is not hardwired in the way that the essentialists would have us believe. The brain can change as a consequence of the experience it has or won't change as a consequence of the experiences it doesn't have. And this is very important in trying to understand you know, where people are with respect to different gender roles. Is it because their brains are different or is it because their brains have been exposed to different experiences? And similarly, we've already come across the idea of the social brain, the fact that there is a context, um, there's kind of social mentalizing. So, and if this is some of the work I've been involved in, if you give two groups of people exactly the same task, but one group are given a negative message, people like you, a very common phrase, aren't very good at these kind of tasks, this is a spatial task, um, but do your best, I want to see what your brain is doing, or people like you are really good at this task, I want to see what your brain is doing. What you find, unsurprisingly, is that people with a negative message make more mistakes. People with a positive message do better. But interestingly, the brain also processes the identical information differently. So the appropriate areas of the brain are activated with a positive message. The less appropriate or less adaptable areas are activated with a negative message. So context is important, as, as we have already touched on. So that's how the brain works. And we did, you know, 30, 40 years ago, if you were, you know, in a medical school, you were learning about the brain, you would not have been told about the brain being predictive or the brain being plastic or the brain being permeable. You would have been given the idea that you've got this amazing machine, but it's, you know, responsive and, and pre-programmed, etc. The other thing we now, um, and again, this has been touched on a lot, is the idea that, you know, what is your brain for? How, how come the human race has become so successful? Let's have a look at the evolutionary changes in the brain. And a lot of the early focus with brain imaging was looking at cognitive skills like language and creativity and, and how people write poetry, solve amazingly complex mathematical problems, etc. But more recently, people have started looking at the fact that the secret of human, the human race's success could well be the fact that we are social beings. We devise collaborative groups, we have support networks, we solve problems collaboratively. And this is where the kind of work, again, that I've been involved in shows that the frontal areas of the brain, the newest, evolutionary newest parts of the brain, are also involved in, and this is where we have a whole load of, of different uh, tasks which we give people in scanners. We can understand how the, uh, a sense of self activates parts of the brain differently. A sense of other people, very important, in-group versus out-group. Sense of belonging, and I've highlighted that because that's going to be the kind of closing part of my story, is to say it's really important that you feel you belong to the group you want to identify with. Social norms, social scripts, social rules, and the one S I missed out was stereotypes. We can also see how stereotypes develop in the, in the brain. So you can actually manipulate the emergence of stereotypes. So we're not just looking at correlation, although I'm aware that's a difficult uh, area to negotiate, we can demonstrate that we can actually um, change the brain in particular ways and get semantic stores uh, altered by, by the tasks we give people. And this is associated with a, a kind of cartoon version of the, the social network we talked about earlier. So the frontal areas are, are storing and processing all of this information, but we also have our evolutionarily old emotional aspects, which are looking at you know, the social reward aspect. If you're in a social situation and you're rejected, your emotional affective processing centers will tag that as a negative experience. And the prediction will be next time you go into that situation, you're going to have something similar. So perhaps you should avoid the situation. And also the part of the brain that Wim mentioned, which I've characterized here as like a traffic light system, the, the error evaluate system, is a system which is looking at this interplay and it actually controls behavior. It's a very powerful control system. 
But generally, its control is inhibitory in the face of negative information. And I think that's important to hang on to. So if the brain's owner, if you like, has experienced something negative, then the next time that situation occurs, then there will be quite powerful inhibitory mechanisms to overcome in order to ignore um, the, the messages you're getting about a particular situation. So this is the kind of work that I've been involved in, and again, given that we haven't got very long, uh, you'll be pleased to hear, I won't be going into all of this in, in huge amounts of detail, but um, I seem to actually spend quite a lot of my time uh, putting people in scanner and giving them, making them miserable, uh, giving them negative social experiences. So there's, um, you know, just contemplate where you are in your hierarchy at work. Do you think you're, you're pretty high up or are you pretty far down, don't get much say in anything that goes on? Or you, or you say, say to somebody, to somebody you know, you've made, made a big mistake, mistake uh, just got a rejection letter through the post, how much of that is down to you? You know, how much of that is you not getting the right qualifications? Or you've made some kind of mistake or, or social faux pas, etc. And a whole range of other things, even little video games where people feel they're being rejected by the other players in the game. All of these associated with quite marked drops in self-esteem and activation of that part of, of the brain um, which Wim has mentioned, the anterior cingulate, the error evaluate system, um, the go-no-go -go system, all of those particular uh, negative social experiences activate that part of the brain. And what's interesting is that that particular activation pattern is also associated with real pain. So if you have suffered some kind of disease or you have broken limb or you've got some um, colleague who's saying, would you mind if I just give you this little electric shock and I'm just going to turn it up a slight bit more and, and maybe a bit more, those areas of the brain are activated. So it demonstrates that, that negative social experiences are very powerful drivers, very powerful inhibitory drivers. And if we look at um, the behavioral correlates of these kind of changes, and this is some of the clinical work I've done, looking at individuals who have very poor self-image, who have high rejection sensitivity, who somehow develop a belief that a perhaps quite neutral comment or observation is a suggestion that they don't belong, that they're incompetent or whatever. Similarly, high levels of self-criticism. So, you know, you're always blaming yourself. If something goes wrong, it's something that you've done. Uh, and that links to things like imposter syndrome. And also more extreme, the kind of self-silencing, where somebody says, you know, I'm, I, I don't belong here anymore. I'm going to withdraw. I'll either, you know, com keep completely quiet. I won't contribute. You know, I'll, I'll stay way, way below the radar. Or I'll actually leave. So I think if, if there was only one slide, I, if I was only allowed one slide, I would say this actually tells the story that if you've got different groups of people, could be male, could be female, could be ethnic minorities, people with disability, whoever, you know, wherever there is a kind of bias within an organization, for example, these people will have different experiences. The negative experiences will contribute to their behavior. And then in terms of this self-fulfilling prophecy that somebody mentioned earlier, then they will actually demonstrate maladaptive patterns of behavior. So this is where, and I think we might hear about it this afternoon, people with a very well-meaning you know, uh, intention will set up diversity initiatives or recruitment initiatives. We need lots and lots more females in our, our robotics center. Um, and so they, they you know, have a big push and they get lots of, of females, but then the females don't feel included. They don't feel they belong and they leave. And then people say, well, you know, look what happens when we, you know, we've done all of this work in trying to encourage people to join our organization and, and what happens is they've left. And the take home message of that is really diversity is not enough. We need to look at inclusion as well. So, the, again, the sort of take-home message is that we need to think of the world as a brain influencer. A lot of people say, is it nature or is it nurture? And I'm way beyond, you know, this is, that's, you know, that dichotomy has had its, had its day, it's past its sell-by date. We need to realize that what's going on in the outside world is entangled with what's going on in our brain. Our brain will therefore change, process information differently, drive our behavior differently, and therefore we will start to demonstrate different patterns of behavior and maybe fulfill expectations, negative or positive, in the outside world. So we need to know that what goes on outside the brain is really as important as what goes on inside the brain. And neuroscience supports that aim that people have. 
So we could leave it there. We could say here's a nice blank screen on which we might um, fill in what we think about the outside world, whether or you know the evidence is a bias that we've already talked about, different kinds of bias processes, the way in which um, people bring expectations to a particular situation, the way you can demonstrate behaviourally, they respond quicker to a, a, you know, a kind of prior bias that they have, etc. But I thought, given that one of my other passions is, is the underrepresentation of women in science, I thought it'd be quite interesting just to say, let's have a look at some of the ways in which the science of culture functions in the outside world and say to ourselves in the arguments that you know in the gender equal countries we have a nice level playing field in science and yet women are still choosing not to do science that's a very quick way of saying i'm going to kind of bombard you with evidence that there is not a level playing field in science uh, overall on average, I should say. So we know that stereotypes are harmful. I've been working with early years groups on looking at the ways in which very young children's behavior, self-belief is altered by stereotypes. And there was some work done last year looking at the effect of stereotypes on creativity, which led to Lego, for example, announcing that they would no longer indulge in gendered toy marketing. And France has led the way in that they now uh, have legislated against gendered toy marketing. And a lot of people will say, oh, eye-rolling, political correctness, let boys be boys, you know, girls like playing with, with dolls, and, and later on we might hear about monkeys like, liking to play with tractors, and people at dinner last night already had my rant on that, so I won't, I won't go into that. So there is a belief we are feeding these stereotypes from a very young age. And for example, you could say, let's have a look at science. What kind of belief is there about scientists? If you're somebody, would I like to be a scientist? Let's have a look at the kind of stereotypes out there. And all of us are familiar with um, the various sort of messages, you know, what the scientist looks like. Um, and you get t-shirts like, too pretty to do maths. Um, and you get even, uh, I gave a talk in Uppsala not so long ago, and I was saying, you know, the message that universities give about science is important, and it, nodding earnestly. And I said, you know, look, for example, at the, um, the, this is from a university website about, you know, what kind of things goes on in physics and astronomy and who does physics and astronomy, and they all horrified, and then I told them that I'd actually taken it off their website that morning. So, um, you know, it is something that we need to pay attention to. Um, and again, moving along to say, well, there are all, all sorts of other things. We have, you know, the well-known um, people who stand up and say women shouldn't do science because constitutionally they're not capable. So we have the Larry Summers effect, the Google Memo effect, Alessandra Strumia saying physics shouldn't waste its money on training women to do physics because physics is a male subject. We have beliefs that people who are going to do really, really well have to be born to be uh, a genius, you know, there's some kind of innate factor. And if you look at those subjects um, where there is the biggest underrepresentation of women in science, here characterized by the numbers of female PhD students, the subjects which have the uh, biggest underrepresentation of, of women in science, like, like physics and, and engineering, for example, also have the strongest belief that you need to be born to be brilliant to succeed. And there's all sorts of other examples that I'm sure people will come up with. Similarly, if you need to feel that you belong somewhere, and this is just some statistics from Women in Science and Engineering organization in, in, in um, the UK, looking at the number of ICT professionals over 10 years, and you can see that the very, very small percentage of women ICT professionals is just about flatlining over that 10 years, whereas there's a massive gap anyway, which is steadily increasing. So if you go into ICT as a female or somebody from an ethnic minority with a disability, you're very much a loner. And if your brain is saying it's really important that you find a niche somewhere where you belong, that is a, a, a pressure against it. And similarly, um, lots of evidence within um, science itself about citation practices, about who gets the biggest grants, who's the first author, etc. So there is a culture in science which is very, very biased. And because we know that changes the brain and that changes how you behave, it's something we need to worry about. And just to finish up, to say, 
the idea that there is this culture has been termed, I think it's quite interesting, the idea this is sexist gender harassment. So if you're in a culture which talks about people like you finding these things quite hard, it's kind of stereotypical way of demonstrating it, it actually does have quite a profound effect on your self-belief and your, uh, and your um, belief in yourself. So it's very closely tied. Higher levels of sexist gender harassment ties is tied to imposter syndrome and also a feeling of not belonging. As I've said, that's sort of such an important driver in our brain. And if we look, you know, why it matters, if we look at uh, what's happening in the key areas of the future, uh, looking at robotics and, and, and um, et cetera, and engineering and um, uh, data and, and AI analysis, tiny proportions of women are actually found in those areas, and these little um, shaded areas at the end are the increase in the percentage over the last five years or so. Tiny increases, and in data, in um, uh, data and AI, it's actually going backwards. So that's why it matters, because this is a problem we need to solve, and I think neuroscience has some. Uh, contribution to that. So, only slightly over my time. Um, just to say good luck, you know, with fighting the bias, and, and we really need to do it. Thank you.